Shedding Tears in Amazement with Dharma by Venerable Ajahn Mahabua The basis of death exists precisely in the citta, the mind. As death and birth are both present within it, The chitta itself is never born and never dies. Rather, the defiling influences that infiltrate and permeate the chitta keep us in a repetitious cycle of birth, death and rebirth. Do you understand? Look at the chitta. If you do not see the poisonous nature of the citta, you will fail to see the poisonous nature of these defilements. At the most advanced stage of the practice, the mesmerizing and radiant citta is itself the real danger. So don't think only of how precious and amazing the chitta is, for danger lurks there. If you can view the chitta from this angle, you will see the harm that lays buried within it. Do you understand what I mean? So long as you continue to hold the radiant chitta in high esteem, you will be caught and remain at an impasse. It's as simple as that. Don't say I didn't warn you. When the time comes, you must sweep aside everything until nothing remains. Preserve nothing. Whatever you leave untouched, that is the ultimate danger. Speaking of this reminds me of the time when I practiced at Wat Ndoi Dhammachedi. It was early in the morning, just before the meal. At that time, my chitta possessed a quality so amazing that it was incredible to behold. I was completely overawed with myself. I thought, oh my, why is this chitta so amazingly radiant? I stood on my meditation track and contemplated its brightness incredulous about how wondrous it appeared. But in fact, this very radiance that I found so amazing represented the ultimate danger. Do you see my point? We tend to fall for the radiant chitta. In truth, I was enthralled and already deceived by it. You see, when nothing else remains, one concentrates on this final point of focus, which, as the centre of the perpetual cycle of birth and death, actually manifests a condition of fundamental ignorance we call awija. This point of focus is the highest state of awija, the very pinnacle of the citta in samsara. Since nothing else remained at that stage, I simply admired Awija's expansive radiance. Still, that radiance did have a focal point. It can be compared to the filament of a pressure lantern The filament grows brightly, and the light streams out to illuminate the surrounding area. That was the crucial consideration, 
the one that so amazed and struck me with awe, then causing me to wonder. Why is my chitta so incredibly bright? It seems as though it has completely transcended the world of samsara. Look at that. Such is the magnificent power that Awija displays when we reach the final stage of practice. I didn't yet realize that I had fallen for Awija's deception. Then suddenly, spontaneously, a maxim of Dharma arose as if someone had spoken in my heart. How could I ever forget it? If there is a point or a centre of the knower anywhere, that is the nucleus of existence. just like the bright centre in the filament of a pressure lantern. Look at that. It told me exactly what I needed to know. This very point is the essence of existence. But even then, I could not grasp the meaning I was bewildered. A point. A centre. It meant the focal point of that radiance. I began investigating that point after the Venerable Acharya Mun passed away. If there is a point or a centre of the knower anywhere, that is the nucleus of existence. Had he still lived then, my confusion would immediately have elicited this answer from him. It's that focal point of the radiance. And then that point would have instantly disintegrated. For as soon as I had understood its significance, I would also have known its harmfulness, thus causing it to vanish. Instead, I was still carefully protecting and preserving it. The ultimate danger, then, lies right there. The point of ultimate danger is the core of brilliant radiance that produces the entire world of conventional reality. I will remember always it was the month of February. Venerable Acharya Mun's body had just been cremated and I had gone into the mountains. There I got stuck on this very problem. It completely bewildered me. In the end, I gained no benefit at all from the maxim of Dharma that arose in my heart. Instead of being an enormous boon to me, it became part of the same enormous delusion that plagued me. I was confused. Where is it? This point.
It was, of course, just that point of radiance. But it never occurred to me that the centre of that radiant chitta would be the ultimate danger. I still believed it to be the ultimate virtue. This is how the Kalesas deceive us. Although I had been warned that it was the ultimate danger, it still cast a spell on me, making me see it as the ultimate virtue. I'll never forget how that dilemma weighed on me. Eventually I left Wat Doi Dhammachedi and went to Chiang Mai. I stayed there for three months, living deep in the forest at Pa Dak Cave, before returning to Wat Doi Dhammachedi with that mystery still weighing heavily on my mind. Then, while staying on the mountain ridge there, the problem was finally solved. When that decisive moment arises, affairs of time and place cease to be relevant. They simply don't intervene. All that appears is a splendid, natural radiance of the citta. I had reached a stage where nothing else was left for me to investigate. I had already let go of everything. Only that radiance remained, except for the central point of the chitta's radiance, the whole universe had been conclusively let go. So can you understand what I mean, that this point is the ultimate danger? At that stage, supreme mindfulness and supreme wisdom converged on the focal point of the citta to call it to account, concentrating the force of the whole investigation on that point. I reached the stage where I wondered why one citta had so many different aspects. I can state unequivocally that every aspect of the citta was known and each known aspect was subject to change. No sooner was it grasped than it changed. One aspect was seen as being good, another as being bad. The investigation centred on that point, analysing everything, trying to understand. Why does this one single citta have so many different aspects? It's as though it is not unified. No matter which aspect of the citta came under investigation, all of its possible permutations were clearly understood according to the profound subtlety of that level of practice. Where supreme mindfulness and supreme wisdom work together. Combined, the two forces were able to keep up with all the chitta's variations, no matter how subtle. One moment it's bright, the next moment it's tarnished. Why does this chitta have so many different aspects?
the changes come from within. See, I'm beginning to catch up with them now. One moment there's sukha, happiness. The next moment there's dukkha, unsatisfactoriness. In the realm of conventional reality, such conditions are invariably an integral part of the citta. With nothing else to investigate, supreme mindfulness and supreme wisdom concentrated directly at the point where the changes occurred. One moment there was sukha, the next moment dukkha. One moment brightness, the next moment a slight dullness. But you must understand that the shifts from sukha to dukkha, or from brightness to dullness, were so slight that they were just barely discernible. Nonetheless, Supreme mindfulness was right on top of them the entire time. Why does the citta have so many variations? At that juncture, mindfulness dropped everything else and turned its full attention to the prime suspect. Every aspect of the investigation came together in the citta, and all of them were interrelated. For at the highest level, supreme mindfulness and supreme wisdom are so extremely subtle that they permeate and penetrate everything without exception. Supreme mindfulness and supreme wisdom at this paramount level differ from the automatic mindfulness and wisdom that are used to reach that final stage. Automatic mindfulness and wisdom work in unison, without prompting. They investigate things in successive stages, chopping them to pieces, section by section. At the paramount level, supreme mindfulness and supreme wisdom also work in unison without prompting, but they permeate everything simultaneously. At that time, they were examining the citta's central point of focus. All other matters had been examined and discarded. There remained only that one small point of knowingness. It became obvious that both sukha and dukkha issued from that source. Brightness and dullness, the differences arose from the same origin. Why was it that one citta had so many different characteristics? Then, in one spontaneous instant, 
Dharma answered the question. Instantaneously. Just like that. This is called Dharma arising in the heart. Kalesas arising in the heart are forces that bind us. Dharma arising in the heart frees us from bondage. Dharma arose suddenly, unexpectedly, as though it were a voice in the heart. Whether it is dullness or brightness, Sukha or Dukkha. All such dualities are Anatta, not Self. There. Ultimately, it was Anatta that excised those things once and for all. Non Self. This final, conclusive insight could arise as any one of the three characteristics of existence, depending on a person's character and temperament. But for me personally, it was anatta. The meaning was clear. Let everything go. All of them are anatta. Suddenly, in comprehending that these differing aspects, dullness, brightness, sukha and dukkha, are all anatta, the citta became absolutely still. Having concluded unequivocally that everything is anatta, it had no room to manoeuvre. The chitta came to rest, impassive, still, in that level of dharma. It had no interest in atta, or anatta. No interest in sukha or dukkha. Brightness or dullness. The chitta resided at the centre, neutral and placid. but it was impassive, with supreme mindfulness and supreme wisdom. Not vacantly impassive, gaping foolishly like the rest of you. Speaking in mundane terms, it seemed inattentive, but in truth it was fully aware. the chitta was simply suspended in a still, quiescent condition. Then, from that neutral, impassive state of the chitta, the nucleus of existence, the core of the knower, suddenly separated and fell away, Having finally been reduced to anatta, brightness and dullness and everything else were suddenly torn asunder and destroyed once and for all. It 
In that moment, when Awija flipped over and fell from the chitta, the sky appeared to be crashing down as the entire universe trembled and quaked. For in truth, it is solely Awija that causes us to wander constantly through the universe of samsara. Thus, when Awija separated from the chitta and vanished, it seemed as if the entire universe had fallen away and vanished along with it. Earth, sky, all collapsed in an instant. Do you understand? No one sat in judgment at that decisive moment. That natural principle arose on its own and passed its own judgment. The universe then collapsed on its own. Originating from a neutral state of the citta, the happening took place all so suddenly. In an instant, the entire cosmos seemed to flip over and disappear. It was so brilliant. Oh my, really and truly magnificent. Too extraordinary to be captured in words. Such is the amazing nature of the Dharma that I now teach. Tears flowed when I experienced it. Look at me even now. Even now my tears are flowing at the recollection of that event. These tears are the work of the Kundas, the aggregates. Please understand that they do not exist in the natural state of purity that appeared at that moment. That natural state appeared suddenly in all of its incredible magnificence. I want all of you who are so complacent to realize what the Dharma of the Lord Buddha is really like. Oh, so truly, truly amazing. My goodness, the tears came streaming down my face, utterly astounded. I exclaimed, Is this how the Lord Buddha attained enlightenment? Is this how he attained enlightenment? Is this what true Dharma is like? It was something that I had never conceived or imagined. It simply arose, unexpected, in an instant. Indescribably amazing. Look at me. I am crying even now as I remember how amazing it was. The memory is still fresh in my mind. It has remained with me ever since. My whole body trembled at that moment. 
it's difficult to explain. Everything happened at once. The sky came crashing down and the world completely vanished. Whereupon I kept repeating, What? Is this how the Lord Buddha attained enlightenment? But actually it was unnecessary to ask because I had encountered the truth myself. Is this what the true Dharma is like? Is this what the true Sangha is like? All three had come together, merging into one supreme, remarkable Dharma. what I call the Dharma element. What? How can the Lord Buddha, the Dharma and the Sangha be one and the same thing? I had never imagined it to be possible. The Buddha is the Buddha. The Dharma is the Dharma. The Sangha is the Sangha. This had been impressed in my heart ever since I was old enough to understand such matters. But at the moment when the Supreme Dharma arose in all its brilliance, all three were of one and the same nature. The true nature of amazing Dharma. Once it arose in all its brilliance, things that had lain in obscurity, things I never knew, were suddenly illuminated and revealed. I'm not fabricating a fantasy to deceive people. Even now that extraordinary Dharma moves and amazes me. It is all-embracing, an encompassing luminosity that lights up the entire cosmos, revealing everything. Nothing remains hidden or concealed. Then the consequences of good and evil and the existence of heaven and hell, strike one with the irrefutable force of the obvious. I wish they could strike all you sceptics with such force, all of you who have allowed the Calaisas to deceive you into believing that there is no such thing as the consequences of evil. No such thing as the consequences of goodness. No such thing as heaven and hell. They have existed since time immemorial, and they have been all pervasive. You just have not perceived them yet. Do you understand? These things have existed always. They continue to harm those who are foolishly ignorant of their existence and so blinded by the Kalesa's deceptions that they never glimpse the truth. <laughs> 